Muted. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone, wherever you might be. Welcome to um, this webinar, um, Landscape Fuel Treatments and Wildland Fire Management Strategies Within Recent Large Fire Events. I'm Janine Creighton, Administrative Director for the Northwest Fire Science Consortium, and I'm really happy that you're all here. Um, just as we all know, just gentle reminders about Zoom. Um, so this is a webinar, so um, you won't be able to actually ask any questions verbally, but please use either the Q&A or the chat, and um, don't be afraid to put questions in those, um, in, in those areas throughout the, the um, webinar, and then at the end, we'll have enough time for um, question and answer period. So um, I think other than that, this um, uh, webinar is being recorded, as all of our webinars are, and it will be posted on the YouTube page for the Northwest Fire Science Consortium, um, probably within a day or two. So. And without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let Susan get started and introduce her team. Hi, my name is Susan Pritchard. I'm with the University of Washington <laughs> School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. And I'm really pleased to present some hot off the press research that I've been working on with um, a number of collaborators. Today, um, Rebecca Lemons from Oregon State University and Nick Povac are joining me for the presentation just to mix it up um, some and have been main collaborators on the research. I also wanted to acknowledge the hard work that Vivian Griffey has um, contributed for this research. Um, Paul Hesberg, Brian Salter have also been involved amongst um, a lot of the fire environmental research applications team. So we're actually focusing on recent wildfire events in North Central Washington, um, which we'll get into in just a moment. I wanted to let everyone know that I actually live full time in the Metau Valley, which is in North Central Washington. So this particular research has been very near and dear to me as I live and do research on fire in the Metau Valley and around the Metau. I'm very aware that um, people, indigenous people have long managed and tended these lands with fire. And so I wanted to start this presentation by respectfully acknowledging the Confederated Tribes of the Colville and Spokane people who have lived in and cared for these landscapes for thousands of years. I recognize that we can and must do more to build better relationships, support their voices and acknowledge our past. All right, um, I want to do one more acknowledgement and then we'll keep going. Um, Joint Fire Sciences Program has supported my career for a very long time. I really appreciate that um, we received funding from JFSP, and I also wanted to acknowledge that JFSP um, has been recently um, kind of given a more an infusion of support, and it's long overdue, and I'm really excited to see what else JFSP is going to support in the future. All right, so if I were to take many of you in a walk in the woods in and around North Central Washington, especially where Ponderosa Pine resides, a lot of the forests have um, crowding from a long absence of fire. So many factors have contributed to this, including um, forced removal of indigenous people and curtailment of their burning practices. Um, we don't have a lot of time to get into all the factors leading to fire exclusion, um, but we have been experiencing a lot of fires that are now burning accumulated understory fuels and canopy fuels in this condition and leaving a lot of these ponderosa pine forests that are built to last fire um, in, a, in a changed state. So a lot of them are having to start over in warmer, drier climates. Um, this effect is definitely um, pronounced on some of these post-fire landscapes. Um, here's one of a, a sobering view from the 2014 Carlton complex in Upper Finley Canyon. Again, this is ponderosa pine country I use this slide a lot just to um, recognize that some of the patches of standard placement are staggering in size and represent a big change. So for our presentation today, we're really doing um, an overview of research to better understand drivers of fire severity, what's leading to these really large wildfire events, and um, what are these fires leaving us with to manage in the future and hopefully um, 
foster greater resilience to future fires. So Nick Povak is going to um, give a presentation on fuel treatment effectiveness and other drivers of fire severity. Rebecca Lemons actually got to do um, really great work um, study on firefighting effectiveness in some of these fires. So we can learn how firefighting response um, uh, supported um, the efforts in these fires and what we can learn for maybe more efficient use of, especially fire lines. And then I'm here to introduce the study as well as to provide you with some kind of lessons learned and next steps, um, as well as lead a QA, Q and A. So just to introduce this topic, again, I mentioned that I've lived in the Metau Valley for um, quite some time. I actually moved to the Metau, which is um, just east of North, Cent North Cascades National Park, way north, um, about two hours north of um, Wenatchee, Washington, just to give you a sense for where this rural area is. When I moved to the Metau, um, it was partly because I'm fascinated by fire adapted forests. And so I have to admit that when the 2006 tripod complex fire blew up, I was excited about it. There was this, this excitement about, wow, this is a really large fire and I want to learn from it. And um, I mistakenly thought that this 175,000 acre fire right here near Winthrop was going to be the largest wildfire event in my career. That has not been the case. And I know that this is a common refrain for others in different regions of the United States and Canada and elsewhere in the world. We're seeing a lot of large fire events. So I wanted to kind of bring you through my experience and our experience of these um, large wildfires in North Central Washington. Dina Kova and Sabas Berry from um, University of Washington really put together a very nice story map that documents a lot of the change that we've experienced in this region from wildfires from um, 1950 all the way to present. Um, what I'm showing here is just a fire perimeter map for the wildfires we focused on in 2014 and 2015. Um, compared to the tripod fire, these were even much larger. And um, I quickly realized that, you know, the tripod was just one of many fires and 2014 and 15 represented a a huge change for North Central Washington. Um, this is what um, the fires looked like in terms of stacked up fires from 1950 to 2015 at the end of that um, era. Um, and I'll just kind of show you in bar chart form how much things have changed since um, the mid 19th or 20th century. Very few fires in the 1950s started to get more in the 1980s and 1990s. And then things have really ramped up in since 2000. Again, I recognize that many of you experienced this same pattern in where you live. Um, we chose to focus on 2014 and 2015 and standout events. Since then, we've had some very large wildfire events too, 2018, 2020, and 2021. So this trend of large wildfires has definitely continued. Here is a map, um, again, from this excellent story map, just showing that compilation of fires that we've now had, um, especially since 1980 or 1990 um, in North Central Washington. And um, what I wanted to share with this map is, is that um, Gina and Saba put a really nice way of showing that recent wildfires, there's some reburn in this hatching mark. This is only showing the most recent year of 2021. But um, something that's very conspicuous about all these fires as they've layered on together is um, very little reburn to date. Um, fire excluded forests especially have been burning and then puzzle piecing together as the next fire event burns. So I'll just show you some of this in a burned area reflectance classification. So here we have burn severity imagery that is available with the first Landsat TM imagery in 1984. These are the, uh, the burn atlas data from 1984 to 2000 for our area. Red is high severity, orange, moderate severity, yellow, low severity, and gray is unburned islands or very low severity. So we'll just kind of step you through this. And as you're taking a tour of all these fire events as they've um, stacked up on these landscapes, it's a smoke-free tour. Those of us who have lived in this region have um, experienced a very um, 
challenging set of summers um, from smoke as well as um, the fire impacts to our communities. 2014 is when the Carlton complex hit. 2015 was a very large wildfire year for us with North Star um, hitting um, the Colville Reservation, Tunk Block, Line Belt. Um, I'll um, get into some of these fires with Nick's presentation. 2017, Diamond Creek. 2018, McLeod and Crescent Mountain. 2019 and 20, Cold Springs, Pearl Hill fires, very large. And we don't currently have burn severity imagery for 2021. It's still being processed, but we have another puzzle piece here and here. So in addition to just showing you how these fires have bumped into one another for the most part, um, I also wanted to point out that non-forest areas, there are some forests here around OMAC and Okanagan, but a lot of it is actually in grassland and shrub steppe. We're seeing low severity, lower severity. Forested areas, um, you can see that there's a lot more high severity and that's one of the motivations for this study is looking at um, what drivers really um, end up leading to a lot of this high severity fire. So quick review of treatment scenarios. I'm pretty passionate about um, some of the research that I do because it is so applicable on the landscape. And so um, some of our studies on the ground as well as using satellite imagery has re have really evaluated um, how treatments have fared in um, these past fire events. So here's just a picture of an unmanaged forest, one that's experienced at least 100 years of fire exclusion. Um, we also have some areas where there's been thinning on its own um, been used in some of these forests and then thinning um, in addition to prescribed burning. The one that I'm not showing that's also very important is managed wildfires and just also um, under burning um, without thinning. And so some of those treatments have definitely been done in these areas too. So it's important to think not only in terms of treating individual stands or patches and um, hopefully influencing their outcomes in wildfires, but also thinking about how broad landscapes in our areas um, have been influenced by fire exclusion. This um, set of repeat photos um, taken originally by the General Land Survey Office um, in 1934, and then a repeat photo taken by John Marshall in 2010, just show um, that for this south, southwest facing slope near Wenatchee, Washington, there's been a lot of infilling of forest. A lot of this has been Douglas fir on pretty poor sites. So you're actually seeing some influence of um, defoliator insects um, um, hitting these areas too. So I'm just showing um, an example of kind of our scale of our problem. So it's not only just at a patch level that we really need to concentrate, but also how do we effectively scale up treatment so that we end up influencing the resilience of landscapes to future fires. With that, I'm going to move it over to Nick Kovac. You'll do the slide for me, Susan? Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking time out of your day to uh, uh, better understand that some of the research that we've been doing. Uh, here, I'm gonna show you uh, the sort of broad modeling um, we've done to kind of better understand the, the kind of main factors that are driving patterns in fire severity. And here we selected out the 2014 and 2015 fires in North Central Washington. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a map of those fires. Susan kind of showed them in context with the broader um, sort of history of fire in the area. You can see that they, uh, you know, at the time, these were sort of the, you know, back-to-back -back most exceptional fire years in modern history until, you know, 2020 and 21. Um, but you can see they, they span a pretty broad geographic region and uh, inherently in this area that means they uh, span a pretty broad uh, environmental gradient, climatic gradient. So we're getting a, a wide variety of climates, um, different biophysical uh, conditions across these areas. And, um, you know, these are, you know, enormous fires and a lot of times these large fires are associated with sort of like catastrophic ecological impacts. And we indeed do see that in, in a lot of the area, but we do also see a lot, um, sort of patterning in the severity. So we have here 
fire severity, uh, low severities in green, all the way up to high severity in red. And you can see it's not all red. And so that suggests to us that there's probably some um, mixture of effects or, or factors that are driving um, fire severity, not all just sort of climate and um, fire weather. So we sought to better understand if we could um, kind of disentangle those factors and, and develop some predictive models to help identify those factors. Uh, next slide. So there's a lot that goes behind, you know, sort of the environmental drivers of severity. It, there's multiple factors and they're all operating at different scales and, and they vary across space and over time. Um, but you can kind of lump them into two broad categories. So you have these top down factors such as climate and fire weather. And if you look at this graph on the right, those are all the way, you know, kind of on the right side of the graph and the top of the graph. So they're operating at sort of broader uh, temporal and spatial scales. And then you have bottom up factors like fuels and topography that operate at um, sort of fine to meso scales. So when they sort of combine their effects, you can see sort of patterns on the landscape. And so those strengths of those factors vary across a fire, within a fire, um, and those factors are, are highly interactive. So for instance, things like fire weather can be um, seen as a sort of top-down driver if it, you know, because part, partly it's operating at fairly large scales, but then also there's sort of terrain um, and trained sort of weather patterns that can sort of affect things at, at finer scales. Um, so our goal and, and sort of the reason we're looking at the, these really large fires is to sort of say, you know, under these extreme conditions where we anticipate these really broad scale top down drivers really running the show, you know, what are the role of these bottom up drivers? And specifically, you know, if it really is sort of climate and weather driving, what, what, what are our options for helping mitigate the, the, the fire severity and what role do these bottom up drivers play? Uh, next slide. So um, yeah, so how can we disentangle these roles? So we're gonna focus here on specifically in the modeling on, on this idea of variable importance and variable importance essentially says, how much influence does a variable have on the response? And here the response variable is fire severity. It's a satellite derived version of fire severity. It's a RBR, a relativized burn ratio. And um, there's two different ways to look at variable importance. One is this global variable importance, which, variable importance, which most sort of um, uh, studies kind of focus on. And it's, it essentially says overall, how influential is a predictor on, on fire severity? So in so doing, you have oftentimes these top down drivers kind of get more weight because they're, they're more influential over larger spatial scales. So more of the data are sort of um, absorbing that effect. And so you get, high variable importance for these sort of top-down drivers. And so you miss some of these um, bottom-up drivers. So for instance, you, the treatment footprint in a lot of these is fairly small, but we know that treatments actually can be influential in, in under certain uh, conditions. So the model may miss that if you're just looking at this sort of global view of variable importance. So then the second thing you can do is look at this local variable importance or what's the effect of a given driver at a given point on the landscape. So this shows you how variables, uh, inter, um, the influence of these variables interact spatially so you can map them. And then you can identi identify factors that could be important but are underrepresented in the, in the larger data set. Next slide. So that's what we sought to do. Uh, we used random forest modeling, which is a very typical uh, machine learning algorithm used in, uh, in this type of research. We looked at both the global and local importance of these different uh, variable groups, we're calling them. So climate, fire, weather, topography, fire history, live and dead fuels, and, and then the treatment footprint. And then uh, you'll see in the next slide, but we, we developed models separately for uh, where the, the 2014 and 2015 fires were sort of first entry fires. They hadn't burned in, you know, 40 or 50 years. Um, and then we looked at reburns, those areas that had actually had a, a recent fires, so they were overlapping fires. And then we looked across all of the 2014 and 15 fires, we sort of lumped them all into one kind of data set. And then we looked at individual fires separately. So we actually just looked at, you know, models developed for each one of those fires that you saw on the map. And then we looked at individual burn days. So we had per, per progression maps that we used to extract the data sort of at a given burn progression day. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so 
um, this is going to look kind of crazy, but I, I just wanted to show, so this is looking at the global importance. So what this over here, and we're going to show a succession of these, but um, so we've lumped them together in, in sort of these variable groups. So the top one is, is you can see that one little square, I don't have a cursor or anything, but um, that one little square, thanks Susan, <laughs> that's, the, that's the climate variable that we use. We use one variable to represent climate, and that was the 30 year normal deficit. And then below that, we have a, another chunk of variables. Those are the fire weather variables. So things like the maximum temperature, the maximum relative humidity and um, wind speed and, uh, and direction. And then we have topography variables. Um, here's valley, ridge and slope, uh, percent slope. And then we have vegetation variables. Uh, those are uh, things like uh, 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 fuel moistures, cover type, uh, can canopy base height. And then we have the treatments on the bottom. So the, the blue ones indicate that that variable had an overall negative effect or so as the you know, deficit got larger, uh, the, the uh, uh, severity went down. And then the, the red ones indicate a positive relationship between the predictor and the response. And then the deeper the color is the more influence or the higher importance that those variables had. So in general, when we looked at these uh, for the first entry fire here, we saw that high severity fire was sort of uh, um, uh, occurred mostly on high elevation mixed conifer forest with high wind speeds, steep slopes, and long time since treatment. So that's pretty sort of um, straightforward. Um, and then can you click on that again? There you go. And so this is for each individual fire. And I'm not going to go into the results here, but I just wanted to show that we saw sort of a mixture of effects and we saw variability in the main drivers across these fires and then click in again. And then similarly for progression days. So we built models for each of these and we sort of saw similar trends, but there was variability within each of these. And so one thing to note is that in for the first entry fire, we really saw a, a, a large influence from the top down variables such as climate and fire weather. Okay, next slide. And then we did it again for reburns. And just this is just to note that what we found essentially was that there was a, a less of an influence of the top down drivers and more of an influence of these bottom up fuels drivers and um, past fire history drivers. So the more intense colors are kind of coming down below, which are represented by the bottom up variables. And so fuels played a larger role. Just want to introduce this NDMI, which is a spectral indice. It's based off of Landsat, but essentially is about the density of, of leaves, essentially. And it also get, it tells you something about the dryness or sort of the droughtiness of, of, of a given pixel. And we're going to see that play out again. Uh, next slide. Uh, and again, yeah, okay, good, great. So that was the global importance. So now we, we talked about local importance. So you can actually look at individual points on the landscape to see how influential each of the variables was on, uh, on fire severity. And so um, the, uh, on the left over here, we have the, the fire severity for that given fire. So that's the observed fire severity given uh, the RBR index. And that's kind of a reference. So you can kind of compare these maps. So then the, the sixth panel over on the right, we have the local importance for these different groups of variables. So here we have live and dead fuels, topography, fire history, and then on the bottom we have the management variables, climate, and then fire weather. And so you can see the redder you are, the, the uh, more inc the, the, the influence of the variable was to increase uh, fire severity. So it had a positive influence on fire severity, meaning that it burned hotter because of that variable. And the more blue you are means that the, the, the less uh, fire severity uh, uh, you had because of the variable. So it reduced fire severity because of that variable. So you can kind of make out some of these patterns by just sort of observationally looking at these, and then we'll get into some more statistics. Um, but here we had a mostly forested, uh, this is for the North Star fire, it was mostly forested. We have, um, um, you can see that sort of pocket of high severity fire kind of in the middle. And that was largely driven here by weather and climate. And so there was probably sort of a, you know, kind of a progression day with sort of high winds. And that occurred um, in kind of a, a more cooler sort of moist mixed conifer forest. Um, and then you can kind of see the role of topography a little bit. It, it's kind of isolated, more localized. And you can see that high severity fire generally occurred on the steeper slopes. Okay. Oh, and then, and the, oh, 
go back. Oh, right, never mind. It's okay. You can see it here. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you can just see the management. You can see that the management in general has a small footprint, but mostly it's blue, which indicates that treatments were actually having a, you know, an a, a influence of reducing fire severity at those locations. Okay. So here is a stick pin fire. This is sort of the most northeastern fire. And here you can see that climate and weather was dri driving that huge uh, high severity uh, event in the middle. And this is sort of the uh, cooler environments, um, probably more cooler dominated uh, forest types. And you can kind of see in the top right, there was a little impact of fire history where you have some of the blue overlapping the a previous fire. So that previous fire actually helped reduce the um, fire severity in that location. Okay, next slide. Here's the Wolverine fire. This is sort of our most westerly fire. It was in the North Cascades National Forest and is definitely the coolest shaped fire I've ever seen. Uh, you can see there was a lot of high severity fire, but the weather was actually kind of, um, it wasn't super uh, intense weather. There was some impact of weather in the sort of the Northeast and the Eastern portions, but it was largely driven by fuel, as you can see in the top left. Uh, and then there is some impact of fire history on the right. You can see uh, the, um, the, the blue there indicates that that previous fire was mitigating some of the high fire severity. Uh, okay, and next slide. And then the Carlton complex. So this was the largest of all of them. And on the left, you can see those huge stretches of high severity fire. Um, and most of this was sort of in a sort of non-forest condition, but where there was forest, you can see the severities there. And where there was forest, it was really weather that was driving um, the, the high severity fire here. But you do see uh, localized effects of management on the bottom left there, where you have uh, those uh, polygons indicating past treatments. And it's mostly blue, although there are some areas where it's, it's orange and red, which indicate the uh, you know, severity was actually larger there or higher there. OK, and next slide. So it's really cool to kind of look at those maps and kind of develop narratives for each fire. But we can actually go back and take those um, local importance values um, and kind of go back to the data and sort of see if we can identify general kind of trends in the data that su would suggest what's driving increases and reductions in fire severity based on these variable groups. So what we ended up doing was for each pixel on that landscape, we assigned a variable group that had the most influence in, uh, for that pixel. So then you have sort of this classification as your response variable, and then all of your the predictors that we showed in previous slides as your predictors of, of uh, these groups. So what we can do is sort of, so this is for first entry fires, and what you see is the first cut of this decision tree is uh, the uh, deficit. So it's a climatic variable. So climate was driving, the, is the main variable that's driving this. And so it's saying to the left uh, has the, the lower deficit. So those are the cooler, moister climates, which was probably related to forest type. Um, and so the you know sort of cooler, more uh, mixed conifer forests were experiencing higher uh, fire severities compared to, to the average fire severity across the data set. If you go to the right, all of these are now sort of more typical, uh, you know, uh, warmer, drier environments. And so if you go all the way to the right, you can see that max gust speed is another huge determinant of, of fire severity here for the first entry fire. So here, high wind speed greater than 16 miles per hour led to large increases in fire severity. Um, and if you go sort of in the middle, this is where you can see things like slope, uh, st uh, steep slopes, uh, increasing fire severity. And then just to the left, this sort of NDMI variable, that is that sort of um, how much live uh, uh, canopy is there. And so uh, areas that are more open and have sort of drier conditions led to uh, lower uh, fire severity in the orange. Okay, next slide. And we can do this again with reburns. And so interestingly, the first cut of this decision tree was this distance to fire edge. And so essentially it's saying when you go to the left, you're well within a previous burn. Uh, you're kind of in the core area of that previous burn. So you're within seven, you know, 700 meters from your, uh, the previous burn edge. So under those conditions, uh, we see um, when you have fairly open, dry, uh, 
open sort of forested conditions, uh, you get lower uh, in, in the gray there, you get lower fi uh, fire severity. But when those fuels have sort of um, developed more, maybe you have a denser canopy, even though you're within this footprint, you're getting higher, uh, you know, sort of average, you're not, you're not getting as much of an effect of the, of the previous burn as, as you do if you're a little more sparsely vegetated. And so on the right side of that graph, if you're near the previous burn edge or outside the previous burn edge, um, sort of this is what this is representing. And then, so if you go all the way to the right, even though you're not within a previous footprint, but if you're, if you're dry if, and you have a sort of open forest conditions, you have lower, uh, lower burn severity. And then in the middle, you can see uh, different things like uh, uh, the, the NDMI and then the max relative humidity. So where, where humidity is sort of, uh, uh, yeah, if it's lower, so that would be sort of where it says dry fire weather, you get um, higher severity. Yeah, so lower max, yeah, lower relative humidity is drier. So that led to higher fire severity. And then when you go to the left there, you have more of like moderate conditions. And so um, when, uh, when you're with the, the TS wildfire, that means the time since last wildfire. So if you're in a previously burned uh, patch uh, within the last three years, your fire severity actually goes way down. So, so and then, okay, next slide. And then we can look directly at treatment uh, effectiveness. So this isn't this is the same kind of local importance, but here we're looking specifically at each different treatment. And so on the left you have things like um, uh, clear cuts and clear cuts with broadcast burning, pile burning, thinning, thinning with pile burning, thinning uh, with mastication, thinning with underburn, and then underburn only. And so the gist of this is to show where you, where you have uh, the red. The red on top means that those treatments generally led to higher fire severity, and the blue means they led to lower fire severity. So each one of these treatments had a mix of having a positive and negative influence in fire severity. Thinning and underburning and underburning had a way more uh, uh, effect of reducing fire severity compared to the other treatments to the left, such as clear cutting and uh, clear cutting and broadcast burning. So that indicates that we are actually seeing, when you're just looking at the treatment footprint, we actually are seeing a, a good effect of, of management. Okay, next slide. I just have two more slides. So this is one more of those, uh, those sort of decision trees. This is just looking at um, the treated areas. And so just quickly, um, the, the first split here is canopy base height. And essentially it's saying where canopy base height was greater than four feet, the, the fire severity was greatly reduced. That really suggests a role for treatment in that where treatments can effectively uh, raise the canopy base height, you see this reduction in fire severity. And again, if you go all the way to the right, uh, these are where uh, max gust speed uh, was really high. So under really high wind speeds, if you're um, if you have sort of uh, um, higher uh, uh, or sorry more open fuels, you had more of an average uh, uh, fire severity. And if you had more dense fuels, you had much the much higher fire severity. So this is to say that wind did have a huge influence on increasing fire severity, but where fuels were actually more sparse, you actually did see a reduction in fire severity comparatively. Okay, next slide. So just in summary, we looked at, you know, we really focused on what was driving the, these fire severity patterns. We saw that top-down controls were the main drivers for first century fire, but for reburns, we really did see these bottom-up controls um, exhibiting some kind of control on fire severity, even under these really extreme uh, conditions for these really large fires. Um, and local importance maps showed that bottom-up drivers exhibited highly localized controls and that thin and burn and burn only consistently reduced fire severity. Thanks very much. Hi again, I'm Rebecca Lemon. So I'm going to talk today about the evaluating a methodology for measuring fire line effectiveness. Go ahead, next slide. So real quick, fire lines are an integral part of fire management and help control wildfires. But like with everything, they have costs associated with them, such as money, time, human resources, and also environmental factors, such as erosion and spread of invasive species. It's important uh, What's important is if we can evaluate these fire lines, we can use those, those results to help understand and compare suppression investments, uh, any potential ecological impacts, as well as help inform and 
rehabilitation strategies for after fire events. Next. So last year, Gannon ETL came out with a paper of, uh, suggesting a, a met four metrics for evaluating fireling uh, effectiveness. Uh, he used, uh, he suggested suppression effort, which is just evaluating the amount of fire lines for the fire perimeter, an overall fire line effectiveness, which is evaluating those fire lines that actually held against the fire versus the actual total amount of fire lines, the gauge to total fire line ratio, which is the amount of gauge to your total fire lines, and then the held engaged fire rate or line ratio, which is held fire lines to fire line, fire, the amount of held fires lines to those engaged. It's important to note with his methodology, he uses, relies on two inputs, um, which is fire perimeters and fire lines. And he also incorporates a 50 meter buffer around those fire perimeters. Um, this is because it can be kind of hard sometimes to determine if the fire line is actually engaged, if you know the fire is actually a foot off that fire line or is it considered engaged at that foot or not. So we, he incorporated a 50 meter buffer. Next slide. So we really wanted to understand how effective or how robust Gannon's methodology came up with. So we first wanted to examine the two main inputs that his methodology required, relies upon. So we wanted to understand how does fire line accuracy um, affect your effect, fire line effectiveness results and also how do the fire perimeters influence those results, fire line effectiveness. We also wanted to examine that buffer size that I just mentioned that Gannon incorporates into his methodology. And then we also lastly wanted to look at burn severity. Um, Nick had a lot of great points in his previous slide about how impact burn severity is. So next slide. So for this study, we looked at 13 different fires through Northern Washington. Uh, we incorporated 2014 to 2017 fires um, from, and they span from 1900 to 140, 104,000 hectares. Next slide. So for testing fire line accuracy, we really closely followed Gannon's methodology he set out. And what we did is we manually went in and corrected fire lines using ArcGIS for the spatial inaccuracies that we found, as well as misclassification and duplication errors. We focused on using just three fire line types, which were bulldozer lines, which is very, one of the most common types that you see. And those are using for real quick bulldozers that help clear out fuels in areas often widening the original pathway. Uh, hand lines, which send in fire crews using hand tools to help remove those fuels. And then lastly, we looked at road as complete, which are often established roadways and really require minimal or no additional work to already have fuels removed. Next slide. So for testing fire perimeters and buffers, we used three different types of fire perimeters. We looked at a fire perimeter that came with, uh, that were associated with those fire lines that we received. We also looked at MTBS, uh, which is that monitoring burn, uh, monitoring trends and burn severity database, and then the soil burn severity, the SBS. And for the buffers, we uh, went and modified his 50 meter and tried different metrics. And we used 15, 30, 60, 90, 120, 240, and 480 meters. Next. And then lastly, when we test burn severity, we examined, we used the SBS from that uh, burn area emergency response website. Uh, we used their same classification. We used only the corrected fire lines and then we used a 60 meter buffer. However, because of SBS, it doesn't incorporate all the fires. So we left out nine miles North Star and Tunk fires. Next. So for this graph on the side, the best fire lines, because they have low amount of suppression, um, and high effectiveness, basically a lot of low amount of effort for how effective they were. And then the worst one case is the red box, which is the amount that required a lot of suppression and really weren't effective. So when you're looking at this graph. Now our results uh, showed that actually space, small spatial inaccuracies had little to no effect on the results, which is great because it shows that again, it can be really uh, robust in that math. Um, we, uh, it, it's really incorporated because of that buffer that he incorporated that helps with that robustness. But what we also found was misclassifications 
had a dramatic effect on your actual fire line length. For example, the Renner fire, when we, when we went back and corrected those misclassifications, increased its total fire length, fire line length by over 50%. And you can see it went from this nice low suppression, high effectiveness fire, and it moved actually into this high suppression, low effectiveness event. And this is a part of the kettle complex. And we found similar fires with Graves Mountain and Stick Pen. They had similar misclassifications. Next. So for the results of the fire perimeter, perimeter, perimeters, fire effectiveness is highly dependent on your fire perimeter. It should make sense. There's only two inputs. Um, but what we didn't make a note of is we found that the SBS was probably one of the most reliable fire perimeters out there. Um, and that's because it has an additional uh, field verification during its construction per process. MTBS had a tendency to dissolve the unburned patches. As you can see in Carleton, the MTBS fire perimeter filled in that hole saying that had burned when it hadn't. Next. The results from our buffer, examining buffer size, we found that increasing your buffer size will actually produce an increase in effectiveness those lines that are held and lines that were engaged, which can be very untrue. So you can really skew your results saying they look better than they actually are if you choose the wrong buffer size. So in that corporation, we want to choose buffer size carefully based on what the inputs you are putting into Canada's methodology. Next. Uh, for our results for our burn severity, we found that low severity areas of the fire had low suppression uh, efforts and had a high effectiveness, which is great. That's what you want to see. Um, and we found the opposite for high severity, which was they required a lot more effort and they actually were a lot less effective for those events. But it should be noted that these were the dense mixed conifer forest fires that often showed that. So it ties into what Nick was saying earlier. Um, and what we really want to take away from that is establishing fire lines in these areas that we really may know that our high severity, which can be difficult, I know, um, may not be use of practical resources. Next. In conclusions, real quick, we did find that Gannett's methodology is rather robust, um, but we really need to understand that your fire perimeters and your buffer size should be chosen carefully before you run through his methodology. Um, when you're, you should consider your fire severity when planning future placement of fire lines. And one of the most important points you should take away is this is a retrospective analysis. This is after the fire has occurred and it may be a lot different information than what those field crews are given when the initial fire is happening. Um, but we can still take away that this may help for planning and future placement of fire lines and help reduce costs and site impacts overall. Next. And lastly, uh, we wanted to make note that we, when we were processing them, we no noticed several things. And one of those was there really is a need to prove the quality of record keeping for these fire lines. Um, we had, especially for like misclassifications, can, misclassifications can dramatically change your results. Um, and really this may help actually future research and also more preparations when you improve that quality of record keeping. And lastly, it might just be as easy as just incorporating having oops, incorporating a GPS units on your fireline crews because um, it might be, make it a lot more easier, faster, and accurate in the end. All your season. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was great. So um, I'm just going to bring us to a close and leave plenty of time for questions. Um, I wanted to add to what Rebecca said that um, as we're doing these retrospective analyses, um, record keeping comes up so much. If we could have improved um, record keeping about fuel treatments, where they were done and what exactly was done in addition to um, fire lines, um, that would not only make our job so much easier, but also just give us so much better information for planning for future fires. So speaking of planning for future fires, um, this study was inspired by um, the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy. Um, it's an excellent all hands, all lands approach to um, basically getting ready for future wildfires and climate change um, across the United States and other regions. So. I wanted to just end by saying that um, we really were aware 
as we designed this study that we wanted to help inform how to go beyond just single um, management units and inform restoration strategies for greater resilience. So within that, um, there's kind of these three um, uh, legs to the stool approach to all hands, all lands. Um, the first is restoring and maintaining fire adapted landscapes. Second, build and maintain fire adapted communities. And third, promote safe and effective wildfire response. So really our study focused on restoring um, landscapes and then um, promoting safe and effective response. So I'm just gonna end with some implications around those. So first of all, I think that you've gathered that um, we really did have this opportunity to look at extreme fire weather and very large fire events. Um, one of the questions that I had in it, um, after the Carlton complex hit was, is there any type of treatment that's durable to that type of fire event? And the happy news is, is that actually um, restored forests that have resilient structure. So as what um, Nick was saying, higher um, uh, height to the canopy base, um, and then also um, reduce surface fuels really make a difference for um, these trajectories of these forests, and even in extreme fire weather. Um, there's no way to fireproof a forest. Some areas will um, actually not fare well in extreme fire weather, but it definitely hedges our bets. Um, the other thing that we just really saw very clearly is, is that even though these treatments work quite well, uh, the scale of them is absolutely insufficient. Um, they were dropped in the bucket. I think you got to see some of that with Nick's slide showing the management history. Um, second implication that was really rewarding from this study is, is that I in particular got to um, work with a number of um, local land managers and learn about lessons learned um, from some of these wildfire events. Here's a picture of Lonnie Costin from the Confederated Tribes of the Colville. Um, and Todd Cam from Tenasket Ranger District, now of the Colville National Forest, doing a um, after action review of the 2015 North Star Fire. And this particular unit, I think it was the lucky unit, I forget which one, um, had been previously thinned and prescribed burn in advance of the North Star Fire. When the North Star Fire was kind of barreling its way north under wind, um, crews, local crews, um, we're able to go out to this unit, which is on the Tenasket Ranger District, and do a very patient, careful um, prescribed burn in the middle of summer and fire weather um, that protected this area. It also changed the flow of fire um, away from um, some communities. So we have a lot of anecdotes that are actually in our final report around how and fuel reduction treatments um, they're certainly not designed to limit the occurrence and spread of wildfires, but they can ameliorate wildfire outcomes. Um, strategic networks of these fuel treatments um, can provide defensible space in some areas, as was the case um, with this interface fire. Um, finally, I was really excited to work with Rebecca um, and Becky Kearns on the monitoring fire line effectiveness. Um, we really wanted to do something that helped inform safe and effective response. And so um, we were pleased with the Gannon method. It's um, Rebecca did all this painstaking work. And uh, at one point she said, oh my gosh, that was so much work to find out that I didn't need to do it. But thank you, Rebecca, because I think that this is a very durable method and can really help us in the future understand how we can become more efficient and cost-effective with firefighting methods. I'll just also underscore what Rebecca said that um, these fire lines, the constructed um, fire lines are no small amount of fire lines. I believe that in the 2015 and 2014 fires, there were over a thousand kilometers of bulldozer line constructed. That has consequences for invasive species such as cheatgrass. Um, and so we need to really think about where and when um, we might apply those. Future research. Um, I'm pretty excited about the new um, interagency field treatment decision support system. Um, it's great. So I actually was able to work with Brian Salter on some strategic layers that basically um, what I'm showing here very quickly is 10% um, of treatments randomly located 
um, really just close to where the North Star fire was near the Colville Reservation, 20%, 30, 40, 50, and 60. It was very exciting to make use of the new and improved IFTDIS for strategic um, evaluation of treatments and how they can influence, in this case, um, burn probabilities and flame length. So we can find more in our final report. I don't have time for it today, but I like this um, line of questioning and I would love for some of our research to go forward on this question about how to make use of more treatments um, so that we can build resiliency in our communities and landscapes. I'll just close by saying that we've had oh, just an, a staggering number of fires. What we're presenting today is really about um, first entry wildfires, as Nick called them. So a lot of fires burning, fire excluded forests. Our future is about reburn. And so it's exciting to actually have some lessons learned from this study that will inform um, future fires that are going to be reburning past fires. And with that, I will close and ask for questions. Thank you, Susan. And um, we've got a lot of questions here. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and um, just pull out some that from the chat. Most of them are in the Q&A, but there is one in the chat that came up about half an hour in. And Kathleen um, Roche wonders, did you differentiate fire effects from the actual wildland fire and effects from suppression action, human ignited fire? And if not, would you expect to see a difference? I would love to be able to answer that question. And I will just say that I've tried very hard in the past to look for areas where there have been um, burnout operations where we could look at that. But I, I think I also need you to rephrase the last part of the question, Janine, to make sure I got it all. I might have, uh, let's see. I can look at the chat too. Yeah, you might wanna look at it as well. Um, 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 yeah, if you could just um, ask the question one more time really quickly, sorry. I oh, just me, okay. Um, I'll just read it the way it is. Uh, there might be some words left out. Kathleen might have been writing quickly. Um, do do you differentiate fire effects from the actual wildland wildland fire and effects from suppression human action ignited fire? Ah, I did. Do and that. If not, would you expect to see a difference? Yeah. Okay. So what I would say um, back in tripod days is, is that um, where anecdotally where we were able to know for sure burnouts occurred. Some of those burnouts actually burned hotter than the wildfire itself. And that was pretty painful for resource managers to see. Um, I'm happy to report, again, this is anecdotal evidence just because it's very hard to get maps of exactly where burnouts occurred. Would love to get those. Um, but where we have seen recent burnout operations, my gosh, crews have taken a lot more of a patient approach um, started out burnouts at the top of a ridge and carefully did strip ignitions down, majorly different effects. And I'm really um, encouraged to see that. Okay. Um, here's one that I think, I think might be for Nicholas. Um, given the fire history, it looks like future fire size will be constrained by existing burn patches. Are we seeing the, re the restoration of macro fire patch dynamics? Yeah, I, I don't know about restoration, but like Susan said, I mean, these fires are kind of um, uh, developing, or, you know, kind of filling in the gaps of where fires hadn't burned yet. And so we're getting to this point, like kind of like a tipping point where there really isn't much room for these first entry fires to go. It really, they really are going to be in the future, these reburns. So in terms of the, the, the macro, um, how'd you put it, macro fire shape or re restoration of, the, of that, I think what, you know, I think more to the point, I think we're just going to start seeing how these fires are interacting and we're kind of showing that, you know, past fires, the, the influence of their, their mitigating influence on reducing fire severity does wane over time. So 
Um, but, you know, we just don't have that huge of a sample in this area to sort of say, you know, these general principles as to when past fires are going to are going to, you know, have, you know, a, an effect of preventing fire spread versus mitigating fire severity versus having really no effect at all. So it's clearly we're kind of showing that it's landscape, that landscape context really matters, the fire weather really matters. But under moderate conditions, I think we're going to start seeing um, these fire fire interactions actually uh, driving fire behavior um, uh, on this landscape more so than they have in the past. Anyone else want to weigh in on that to add to that? I liked his answer, sticking with it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so something about the uh, um, the fuel line um, portion. Was maintenance of these fire lines considered? It seems important, says Dave. The problem is that some of those records are just not very good. So, I mean, when you're going to look at like fire lines, it's, they are hit or miss how accurate they are sometimes. Some of them I found were really accurate. And other times, you know, the record keep bringing you were just like, this makes no sense. <laughs> and I'll just chime in and say that um, Rebecca very carefully used deep imagery before and after the fire to um, learn where there were new bulldozer lines versus um, areas where um, perhaps an old road had just been um, recreated. Um, and so um, that's a very important question about maintenance, but we were not able to answer it with this study. Okay. Let's see. Um, John Walker asks, can we develop formulas for small fuel line treatments that could result in more post-fire refugia? Do you want me to take that, Nick, or would you like to? Go ahead. I, <laughs> it's too many words. and, and <laughs> <laughs> so. that's, that's my job, Nick. Strangle <laughs> the words. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Coming back to strategic use of um, fuel reduction treatments and um, Meg Tabon from our local area um, once really reminded me that there is absolutely no way to fireproof a forest. And so when I think about um, fuel treatments, I always think about hedging our bets. Like we don't know for sure they're always gonna work. But one thing we do know is, is that there could be strategic networks. Um, some of these were actually created in the Tenasket Ranger District prior to the North Star that end up giving us a lot more options. For one, they might be so recent that they're barriers to fire spread. Two, they might allow crews to safely go in and do some careful burnout operations to corral fires or mitigate the severity. So um, I think that those networks um, are used really well by managers, but um, our science is still kind of catching up to that. I'd like to look at it more. Okay, so the next one deals with the, they're both kind of talking about costs. Um, the fire line assessment seems to lend itself to cost benefit analysis. And was that considered? And you, you're nodding your heads. And then do you know any costs associated with treatment areas? Well, I think that's kind of the whole point of the fire line effective method is, is to kind of really get at the cost. Because when you have a big fire, and you want to protect people's homes and livelihoods and other stuff going on, it's really hard to go, yeah, that fire line's not really worth it. Um, so when you have it, 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 it's one of those retrospective analysis. And I think it's going to be more for future understanding how effective it is putting a fire line through this stand of like dense mixed conifer trees versus let's do it down the road where we know it's not going to probably burn as hot. I'm going to chime in there because I think that that would be an excellent thing for us to add in our paper, Rebecca. And so um, I'm going to jot that down for sure. <laughs> um, the other thing I will say is that we did notice that there were some fires like the Wolverine and stick pin kettle, well, the kettle complex fires, where um, there are a lot of wasted fire lines. And we're not sure the context of it, but it would be really interesting to ask the question of, 
Why were those constructed um, so far away from the fires um, with very little chance of interacting with the fires? So um, kind of good questions to ask because it seems like they would be costly and we can estimate the investment there. Yeah, I think one of the important things is though, is when you look at like a Diamond Creek fire, they built the fire lines, the few that they put in, at least on the United States side, um, was only to protect a few structures. And after that, it just burned into wilderness. So they didn't construct them. So that was perhaps one of the best examples they had where they didn't just go in and drive fire lines everywhere. Sure. Okay. Um, so I think you mentioned this, but um, are there currently any pub publication publications um, <laughs> to, to go along with this or is that coming with your report? That would be coming with our report. We actually just submitted our report in early October. Mm -hmm. And I'm super happy to share this presentation with anyone. Um, so at the very end of it, I actually provide a link to the presentation or we could actually submit that to you, Janine, to send out. Okay, yeah, ab ab absolutely. So far, we just have the final report, but we actually have um, two papers in prep right now. Okay. Well, we are at time. We still do have a number of questions, but I can send those to you um, panelists and um, you can maybe respond to those. To those. Um, yeah. I want to thank you all, Re Rebecca, Susan, Nicholas, for, for um, doing this and participating. We had a great group and lots of questions and very interesting research. So we're looking forward to the next step that you take in, in this. So. Thank you very much. And we are definitely happy to ask questions um, afterwards as well. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Um, when I close out, there should be a poll that comes up on your screen. Please fill it out. It helps us do our job a little bit better. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon or evening wherever you are. Bye.